Baruchim Aboim. Again, welcome to our home, and I hope you had a great holiday, and uh, we're back in business now. So this week on My Thoughts, hopefully it's a very uh, timely question. Why all the hatred? Uh, this week on My Thoughts, I'd like to examine hatred. Not why the world hates us. After all, there are many reasons that they can proffer as to why they do. My question is, why is it that we hate ourselves so much? We have just celebrated the holiday of Shavuot, the holiday which commemorates our receiving of the Torah from God Almighty on Mount Sinai himself. You know, I believe the holiday was a celebration of something in a sense that was even greater than our receiving of the Torah. The Torah is still with us today just as it was when it was first given to our ancestors from God Almighty, our Father in Heaven, on Mount Sinai. I believe that the true miracle at Mount Sinai, which was a one-time event in Jewish history, occurred when the nation first encamped at the foot of the mountain. That was three days before the giving of the Torah. The verse in the portion of Yisrael reads, Vayichan sham Yisrael neged ahor. And the Jewish people encamped there at the base of the mountain. Now, even the verses, even though the verse is referring to the people, the verb, Vayichan, is singular. The Torah should have used the plural tense, Vayachanu, and they encamped there. After all, there were a multitude of people, not an individual. So Rashi comments on these words and states, Ki ish echad, belev echad as one man with one heart. Rashi continues with his commentary and he states that all the other encampments were with complaints and strife. Now the only other time in Jewish history where we witness a, a true achdut, unity, amongst all Jews was with the story of Purim. However, that unity was brought about through a threat of total annihilation. Purim is seen as the time when the Jewish people accepted once again that which they had accepted previously at Mount Sinai. Now one could say that the nation's acceptance of the Torah at Mount Sinai uh, was actually also under coercion. Our sages tell us that when God Almighty gave the Torah to the Jewish nation, he held the mountain over their heads and said, accept the Torah or here you will die. The verse that attested to their unity occurred only before the actual giving of the Torah to the nation. So in all of our recorded history, there has only been, at best, two times when we were one nation, all united as one, unified in our connection to God Almighty, our Father in Heaven. As the saying goes, two Jews, <laughs> three opinions. Somehow, by our very natures, we are a nation of contrarians. We are prone to question and argue about anything and everything. The proof of that fact is the nation's statement to God Almighty before the giving of the Torah of Na'aseh v'nishma, we will do and only then will we listen. The question is how can these words be a proof? So Rashi tells us that before God Almighty offered the Torah to the children of Israel, he first went around to the other nations of the world and offered them the Torah. Each nation asked him, what is in it? To the descendants of Asa, he replied, you shall not kill. Well, they said to him uh, that they would have to decline. After all, they said that they were blessed by their grandfather Yitzhak of Edom, that they would live by the sword. Murder? Well, that was a part of their collective DNA. Rashi says that God Almighty then went to the sons of Yishmael and asked them if they would accept the Torah. They too asked him uh, what was in it. God told them that it states, you shall not steal. They told, then told God that their ancestor Yishmael was, as it states in Vayera, in the portion of Vayera, that he was Rovek Heshkashis, an expert archer. So the Islam Latora comments that this statement is an allusion to the fact that though Yishmael practiced hospitality, still he did not follow in the footsteps of his father, Avramovina. The reason why he brought travelers into his tent huh, was only to rob them. So they too declined. 
they contended that stealing was a part of their collective DNA. So God went to one nation after another and each declined stating the Torah in one form or another went against their nature. Now as I mentioned earlier when God presented the Torah to the children of Israel they did not ask what was in it. They accepted it sight unseen. They said to God Almighty that for you we will change our nature. We will not investigate. We will not ask questions. If you say that this is your greatest treasure, then we accept it willingly. No questions necessary. What is interesting is that all the prohibitions that God told the nations are really all included in the seven basic commandments that existed from the time of Noah. Whether they accepted the Torah or not, they were still required to adhere to the seven Noahide laws, meaning that they could neither kill nor could they steal. That being the case, then what was God's question to all the nations? Well, the question was, will you change your nature for me? All the other nations declined. It was only the children of Israel that accepted. So, in reality, we are not the chosen nation. We are actually the nation that chose God. However, the reality is that changing one's nature, well, it's easier said than done. Have we really changed our nature as a nation, or are we still contrarians, questioning and arguing uh, basically about everything? I believe that we as a people still possess these traits. In an article posted in Quora, it stated that Jews make up about 2.4% of the population of the United States, yet they comprise roughly 15% of the lawyers in the country. In addition, Jews make up 6.2% of the U.S. Congress. We love to argue. So, is it our nature that is the problem? Or is it our use of that trait that is the problem? I think that asking questions is great. I believe that is what makes Judaism so special. Not only do we answer questions, we actually encourage them. You know, the first holiday of the season is Passover, Pesach a holiday that revolves around children, encouraging them to ask questions. No question is discarded. In fact, the whole Seder is directed to the child, She'ena de Elisho, who just doesn't know how to ask. We see that our religious books are replete with questions. They record debates that occur between the sages. You know, sometimes their debates even became heated. However, the common denominator of all these debates was not ego. It was and always will be a search for truth. Though it may be difficult, we are taught to leave our egos out of our reasoning. This may be another reason as to why the Torah is best studied together with at least one other individual, what we refer to as a chavrusa. You may believe that your opinion is correct. However, you are really a bribed judge. Others, on the other hand, will question your logic and reasoning. We refer to the Torah as Torah Emet, a Torah of truth. The beauty of studying Torah is that when we learn both, the, is that we actually learn both opinions, the one that we accept as the law, and the other opinion which may well be more lenient. In certain cases where following the law is improbable, we are then able to rely on the secondary opinion, what we refer to in Jewish law as Lachat Chila, what one should perform initially, and then bidyevet, what one could perform as a fallback position when necessary. All opinions are considered Torah, whether they are initially accepted or not. When we look around our world today, you know, we see anti-Semitism is obvious and open. The sad fact is that the world is following our own example. One of the saddest facts in Jewish history is the pain that we as Jews have caused ourselves, starting with Korah and his rebellion against Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, our teacher in the desert. Our contrarious nature has always been fertile soil for our evil inclinations. You know, we constantly think of the me instead of focusing on the we. Our egos lead the charge. Whenever we allow our egos to take control, we are, in essence, edging God over. 
There is no greater example that we could witness in Jewish history than Yerobam ben Nevat. He was a great tzaddik who succeeded in breaking the nation into two separate kingdoms, the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah. There were many battles that were fought between the two kingdoms. There, there's a measure that states that God Almighty says to Yerobam that he should repent and that if he does, he and David HaMelech would walk together in paradise. <clears throat> Yerobam asked God, who would walk on your right side? God replied, David. Well, Yerobam refused. Ego. <coughs> Excuse me. You would think that religious Jews would be the most unified members of the Jewish nation. Many religious Jews begin their morning prayers with the words written in the Torah, in the portion of Kedoshim. States that I accept upon myself the precept of the Ahavta L'Riachal Kamocha, that you shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. <laughs> Good luck with that. Religious sects are constantly arguing with each other and their approach to their religious laws and customs. Each sect <clears throat> seems to think that they have the proper path to becoming God Almighty's favorite child. In the meantime, controversy continues to reign supreme. Rabbi Akiva was the greatest advocate of the idea of loving another Jew. And yet we know that 24,000 of his students died during the first 32 days of the counting of the Omer, a 50-day period that began with the second day of Passover and ends with the holiday of Shavuot. Our sages tell us that these students were righteous and learned individuals. However, they failed to show proper kavod, respect to one another. I think that it is not an accident that the gematria, the numerical value of the Hebrew word kavod, is 32, the exact number of days that all of Rebbe Kiva's students died. The great Mayor Pramishlan used to tell the story every year on the holiday of Shavuot in the hope of banishing the hatred, jealousy, and resentment that existed in the hearts of Jews in the hope of bringing the Messiah. Rabbi Shimshim Wiener, a famous Tzaddik from Vienna, enjoyed a, a, a good relationship with the imperial court. One day the emperor asked him, Tell me, Shimshim, why is it that the Jews have been in exile for so long? What sin did they commit to deserve this? Well, Shimshim replied, Well, we were exiled from our land because of sinas chinam, baseless hatred that we harbored toward one another. Well, the emperor was not satisfied with his answer. He told Shimshim that if, you don't, if I don't receive a satisfactory answer within three days, well, I will expel all the Jews that reside in this city. But Shimshim was troubled. He wondered how he would be able to appease the emperor. Well, that night in a dream, a voice said to him, The answer that you gave to the emperor was correct. Do not change it. The emperor will believe you in the end. Well, the next day the emperor went hunting. However, when he was out, he saw a magnificent buck, and he chased after it. However, he hadn't realized that he had separated himself from the hunting party. He found himself alone, and lost in the snow-covered forest. He lost his horse and he had, had to walk. It seemed like miles. But then he saw lights in the distance. There was a small village not far away, but he would have to cross a deep river to reach it. Well, the emperor had no choice but to remove all of his warm clothing and swim across to the other side. When he reached the town, he knocked on one door after the other, but no one would admit him after all. He looked like a, a bedraggled stranger. However, when he knocked on the door of the local tavern, the Jewish owner welcomed him in, gave him a meal, and lent him his fur coat to warm himself. Then he offered him a cot to sleep on for the night. The emperor, I will again, was very grateful. And in the morning, he asked the innkeeper if he would drive him to the palace and, and that he would pay him. The Jew was only too happy to assist, and so he escorted the emperor to the palace. The emperor told him to wait and that he would be paid. In the meantime, the emperor changed his clothing and came down to pay the Jew for his kindness. When the emperor approached the Jew, he asked him, Do you recognize me? The Jew said, No, 
uh, I've never met you before. The emperor then told the Jew that he was the same man that he had so graciously shown hospitality to the night before. Now, at first, the, the emperor offered the Jew ten golden coins, uh, but the Jew didn't respond. The truth is, he was still in a state of shock. So the emperor said, you know, I'll do even better. I will give you a farm, fields, and animals. Would that satisfy you? He said, Your Majesty, I want neither money nor farms. I asked you for just one favor. The emperor said, what would that be? He said, you know, in the next village I have a competitor, another Jewish tavern owner. I want you to force him to close his tavern so that I can take over all of his customers. Hmm. The emperor thought to himself, amazing. But Shimshim was right, after all. Envy and unwarranted hatred is still rampant among the Jews. Our sages also tell us that the Second Temple era was a time of great religiosity, and yet God destroyed his house and exiled the nation. The reason given by the sages for God's action was the sin of sinuskinim, baseless hatred. God's Torah is a great tool to assist a person in overcoming this awful character trait. However, like any tool, it is only effective if one picks it up and puts it to use. Letting it rest on a table affords the owner no benefit. You know, many of our most important prayers end with the Hebrew word shalom, peace, such as the grace after meal, a prayer that we recite after we eat bread. Also the last prayer in the Amida, the standing prayer, it begins with the Hebrew words sim shalom, bestow peace. It is a prayer that we recite three times daily, 365 days of the year. The prayer begins and ends with a request for peace. The Kaddish, a prayer said by a mourner that praises God Almighty, which ends again with a request for peace. There are many other prayers that we offer up to God Almighty, all with a request for peace. The Rambam states that when the Messiah will come, he will perform no miracles. However, he will usher in a new world where peace will prevail. Uh, that elusive butterfly. You know, this word is also used, Shalom, at times to refer to God Almighty himself. Though it is God's wish that we all follow his Torah, more than anything else, he hopes that we, as his children, will stop fighting with each other. Like any loving parent, that fact causes him great pain. Now, he allows certain scenarios to occur in the hope that they will be a wake-up call for us to stop arguing with each other and just love each other. As the saying goes, there is no atheist in a foxhole. How sad it is that we have to experience sorrow and oppression before we turn to God for his assistance. What would happen if all Jews were to come together in love and brotherhood? That would bring the Messiah immediately. In reality, that is all that God Almighty wants. You know, our sages tell us that during the reign of Ahav, who was an evil king of the ten tribes, and who was an idol worshiper. When his troops went out to battle, no soldiers died. However, when Dovin King David's troops went to battle, his soldiers did die. As you read about Uriachiti, Bathsheba's first husband, who died in battle. What was the reason that none of Ahav's troops died? Sages tell us that there was shalom, that there was peace amongst them. Whereas with David's troops, that fact did not exist. We see just how precious peace is viewed by God Almighty, our Father in Heaven. As long as His children live together in harmony, even if they may rebel against Him, still He does not punish them. You know, the massacre on October 7th was horrific. Not just the atrocities that occurred to men, women, and even little children. In some ways, the taking of the hostages was felt even deeper than some of the other pain that the nation experienced. Before October 7th, Israel was thought by many to be on the brink of civil war. God allowed a scenario to occur that would unite all Israelis and Jews all over the world into one unified nation. You know, somehow, even in the worst of times, and even in the worst cases, we still find ways to go back to our contrarious natures. It is so sad that we argue amongst ourselves. We allow our enemies to win. 
the price we have paid and are still paying for baseless hatred. You know, let us take our hatred out on our enemies, on those who want to destroy us, not on each other. As Winston Churchill said to Parliament in 1942, as the war was raging in Europe, if we don't stop arguing about the past, we will not have any future. I know that I can end this thought with the proper answer, that we don't need to hate each other. The world is more than capable and willing to take on that role. You know, the Kutzka Rebbe, Rabbi Menachem Mendel of Kutz, said that insanity was put into this world so that one Jew can look at another Jew, and as crazy as it seems, that he can find merit with him. Let us all come together in love and brotherhood. Let us stop giving our enemies the weapons to defeat us. You know, what will defeat us is not rockets or missiles. We will self-destruct if we cannot find some way to come together. It's time for us to turn to the time when we called out to God our Father in Heaven the words, Nasev and Nishma. We will do and then we will listen. We need to change our natures. Hmm. Not for God's sake, but for the sake of our own survival and the survival of our world. Compromise? We need to find common ground with each other. We need to open our hearts more and our mouths less. We need to focus on love, not hate. On laughter, not tears. On joy, not sorrow. On forgiveness and not judgment. We must come together as one nation, with one God, and one unified purpose, peace. If we don't, I'm afraid that the light at the end of the tunnel may well be a train that's heading right for us. May God Almighty bring a quick and final end to the war in Gaza with the total destruction of Hamas and all the evil in the world. May we bring home safely all the hostages, cure all of those who need healing, comfort the mourners, and return home all of our brave IDF soldiers led by Mashiach Sukaino quickly and in our time. Again, let's hope we can change this and again bring Mashiach. Again, let me thank you for listening. Um, please uh, push the like button and uh, subscribe and again share with your friends. Uh, hopefully this message will find a place deep within all of us and will change the world that we're in. Uh, this